Good morning, Gardenia. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to Adam versus the man. Happy first day of Pride Month. Every month has to have a politicized purpose. We've got a great guest, Ashley, coming on to talk about that later in the show today. Don't worry. We won't use your feels against you, as most people talking about this will. But it is an important cause, and we're very grateful to have a lot of libertarian activists in the outright caucus doing great work, making sure that libertarian values are applied to a situation where a lot of people, righteously so, want to be more sensitive towards gender and sexual minorities, as is the best term I've heard, considering uh, technically that includes everybody, if you think about it. But Mike Shipley, great LP activist, actually did a, a conference call for the LP National that I, I just joined in, they're doing this series of just like educational messaging activist conference calls. I was like, hey, mm, you know, all right. And he really pitched me on, yeah, don't don't play the LGBTQ plus, try to include everybody with their own acronym game, gender and sexual minority. And that's respect for the universality of the human right to express yourself sexually or asexually, however you see fit. So Happy to celebrate that start. We're going to make a month of it. No, we're not. But today is a good day to at least uh, at least have an appropriately themed guest. We've got Ed Vallejo join us as co-host. We've got some. Uh, we've got the biggest cryptocurrency conference. I get this. I get. I get this out of the way. We got a big uh, econ block. I, it's a weird pattern that we sort. Of, weird. It's a nice pattern that we've fallen into editorially with the show. Mondays we do COVID and mental health. Tuesdays, we do econ and international. Wednesdays, we do COVID and whatever the fuck else is big in the world. Thursdays, catch up on headlines for the week. Fridays, good news Fridays. So with that today, we have a pretty big econ block. We got an international block. We got a fun grab bag. We got Ed Vallejo in the co-host chair, which, by the way, the co-host chair right now is 100 yards that way. <laughs> in the old freedom trailer you'll see his cool uh background in just a minute but one sort of general announcement i wanted to get out of the way before we get to uh i mean i do i do like the big general like hey there's a lunar eclipse tonight stay up a couple hours or whatever kind of announcements before we go to gym with producer notes but uh cbs4 miami bitcoin 2021 world's largest cryptocurrency conference Coming to Miami's Wynwood neighborhood, and that is this weekend, June four to five. And I, you know, funny thing is, I would have loved to have gone. Uh, this was the event I was going to when I got arrested in Texas. Uh, it was only two years ago, yeah, January twenty nineteen, uh, and ended up beating five felonies and a misdemeanor down to a four hundred dollar fine, representing myself. But uh, this weekend, I won't be able to make it because I'm going to. And uh, Joey and I were very excited about this fun little trip. Barry Cooper, nevergetbusted.com. If you don't know Barry Cooper, you should. He's been in a kind of like activism semi-retirement for the last decade or so. Um, but when he got out of the, the, the police force, he started busting other corrupt cops with stinks and said, hey, uh, that's, that's my kind of ex-cop. Yeah. Barry Cooper, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're going to be getting him on the show in the next week or two, uh, talking about this documentary. But I am getting interviewed for his documentary. Like, as this, you know how good a documentary it is when they have to interview you in person. Not None of this remote COVID, no pants on kind of shit. No, we are flying out of Vegas Saturday uh, to do an interview in Austin with Barry's documentary crew. Uh, it's not his crew. As I, no, it's like an independent, legit independent. People are doing a documentary of his life. So like, good for him. This is really cool. Uh, so I'm, I'm honored to be participating uh, with that interview on Sunday. And then we'll be coming home on uh, on Monday the 7th. So in and out. if anybody really wants to meet up in and out of Vegas or in and out of Austin, send it. Send Joey an email. <laughs> She'll be traveling with me. Joey at the Freedom. That's J O I E or CEO. Joey at the Freedom Line.com. And with that, executive producer Jim Freedom with the producer notes. 
Good morning to you. What's going on? I haven't made a tab yet, apparently, for Joey at freedomline.com to be able to display. <laughs> he needs to say CEO of Adam versus the man, colon, oh, yeah. Joey at the freedom line. Oh, that's good. I should put executive producer in front of mine also. How is it that colon became the word for two dots presenting the next thing in a sentence and where your body processes shit. Like, can we not come up with two? There's no, there's no semantic etymological connection that I'm aware of. How did that even become? I'm sure. No, Adam, because the colon is two dots. It's a dot in and a dot out. And when you're presenting the next thing, it's food in and the top dot and poop out the bottom dot. No, I just That's made that. Stretch. That's no. a big stretch. <laughs> That's what I'm afraid we're going to hear from the comments today. Ed better have a good comment contest. Uh, but yeah, how did semicolon, how did, I'm so much more comfortable saying semicolon because you know, we don't say semicolon to refer to like the part of your colon dealing with Crohn's disease. It's like, no, it's the colon. It's that's the colon or colon. It, can Come on, English, fix this shit. Okay, sorry, back to you. So like, so, like, does this read ABTM public telegram channel shits HTPT.me forward slash Food and right? poop out, yeah. therefore. Food and poop out. That don't, it just don't work. Why, you're right. It's a messed up. Why is, why is that called that? That's ridiculous. Who I, named stuff? I, <laughs> They're fired. <laughs> 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 Anyways, join the channel. We're public. We're public Telegram. Everybody can join that. It's free. No requirements. If you have Telegram, you can be a part of that group right there. And we got links for all the news we cover. If we don't get to some of the news links. You can see them there. Uh, if you want to be part of our private producers club and get a link to the backstage every day and get 15% off and free shipping on any merch at the website, all those things, you can go to patreon.com. And here I go, not displaying the pages again. Why is my computer being like this? Oh, because we got a lot of new tabs up. That's why. Uh, you can go to patreon.com. As you see here, one, five, ten dollars a month. Ten bucks a month will get you access to that private producer's code that I mentioned and 15% off at the store and everything like that. So definitely check that out and take advantage. After that, we got cigarfederation.com is our affiliate program. They have awesome, definitely exotically flavored cigars you can use uh shop that whole website cigarfederation.com and use promo code adam10 all caps to get 10 percent off of your entire order there so it's a great deal definitely check that out take advantage of the promo code adam10 after that give your eyes a little visual vacation on instagram at the garden of freedom you can scroll through all the pictures and videos of all the cats and crazy people up there in gardenia living life the life of freedom up in Gardenia. So Instagram at the Garden of Freedom. Check it out. Get yourself following that page. Next, the Crypto6.com. Those guys still need your help. Uh, guys and cows, I should say, because I don't even know who's... Uh, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> Go to the Crypto6.com. Click on the button Jim to write, is, you guys. Jim is easily gender confused, apparently. I'm, I'm gender so confused, <laughs> you have no idea. It's, it's hard to keep up with, man. I just always say they at all times <laughs> anyways yeah the crypto six.com you can write the guys that are still in the cages and uh you can donate through the cryptocurrency links that are there so definitely check that out and lastly go green energy online.com great website we promote every day because it's an awesome knowledge base of everything you need to know about solar power micro wind power zero energy homes if you're thinking about doing it yourself and getting your uh getting your life more self-sustaining Visit GoGreenEnergyOnline.com. That's all I got. All right. Thank you, Jim. Co-host Ed Vallejo from the Freedom Trailer. Reporting in GE. Um, <laughs> good morning. Are you calling me GE as some, like, general? Some, I, what is GE? I'm general Electric? You declared yourself God Emperor, blah 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 oh, blah God blah Emperor. blah blah of Gardenia a long time ago. So if I was God Emperor, God Emperor, I would have read your mind and not had to have asked the question. I'm just the king, <laughs> just the king. And so, if, now you're just the king, king huh? Yeah. You're not God Emperor Kokesh anymore. That was, was somebody else's title. Show. No, I'm just king, just king. King is enough. I'm okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> hey man, it's gorgeous out here. What a day. Oh, so beautiful. The sun is warm. The breeze is cool. I was in Vegas yesterday. It was hot. Oh man, working on my truck in the in the sun and just uh, sweat pouring out of my eyes. It was like I was back in Phoenix and I was thinking, man, I can't wait to get back to Ash Fork where it's nice and cool. By the time I got almost to Williams, the temperature dropped so much. I had the window rolled down and I was just, oh, it was so nice, man. And I'm most you, people, yeah, most people who live in the Southwest are idiots because they live in Phoenix, Vegas, or LA. And they're so, oh, and they think, and LA's wrong. LA's bad for different reasons. <laughs> but, but uh, LA and Phoenix, or I'm sorry, Vegas and Phoenix, inhumane, inhospitable, hot, dry. You can't, like, the only reason those cities exist is because of air conditioning and government intervention. And then right here, and it, 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 it's this weird thing we tell people, I'm from Arizona. Oh my gosh, you're from Arizona. How do you survive? How do you get water? You know, do, do you eat cacti? And it's like, um, no, I'm, I'm in the mountains in the forest, you know, with trees and like this little rain. And like, mm, it's the desert. No, fuck you. We get 12 and a half inches of rain per year. The cutoff is 10. This is not a desert. I have five acres in Winslow next to a man who's building in an air park. And I'm going to be able to fly in and out of that space where I'm creating uh, an arts and music venue. I'm, well, you I'm going to acquire land over here. And build a domicile for my wife and I to retire in. I'll be close to here, and I'm just going to fly back and forth. You know, Ed, I, I have, I'm, I'm real. I, I know this sounds to a lot of people like an activist fantasy kind of, or even personal financial fantasy kind of goal. Like I'm just, I'm going to have a private plane. Like, but the, th but what I want to point out is that it's not Ed saying. I'm going to be, you know, top 1% of richest people in America, but I'm going to be organized enough and this shit's available enough. Let's make it happen. At quadcopters, self-flying cars, self-driving cars, private planes, like, and, and this is basic technology we already have that just has been prevented by government regulation primarily, but also driven by corporate protectionism from being fully implemented. You know, the, the Jefferson or Jetsons. Why why don't we have flying cars by now? Well, basically because government. But why not like quadcopter or hover cars to just zip around? Well, we haven't figured out a way to regulate that or control it and make it safe and get our cut. And then what's it going to do to oil and gas? That's where we get so much of our money. What's it going to do to the auto industry? If, if oh, it's going to end the Fed. Yeah, fuck that is. No, but it's like self-driving cars, and I, and I, 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 it's been a while since I've mentioned this, Ed. But the I just that we're gonna get self-driving cars here. I mean, five years as if not the norm, like a dominant part of the reality. Well, guess what? About fifty percent of Americans' interactions with law enforcement happen at traffic stops. You can't pull someone over if they're not driving their car. And just taking away this huge, this is a big chunk. It's a big chunk of the government. Right? How much of the, like, think about, the, you know, the legal system. We Air bitch about the, the, the legal Air system. Police. It's oh. not a justice system. Air but please. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna be unable to generate all this revenue through like, drug arrest. How many drug charges? Like, Joey is here. Joey, just off the top of your head. How many drug arrests happen as a result of traffic stops, percentage-wise, in America? Half, something like that? 70. Use more. Oh, yeah. Okay, because there, there's basically three kinds. Home raids, accidental or intentional. Personal stop and frisk kind of things. Small percentage. I guess you could add stings and, like, sales setups, which is very, very small. And then it's traffic stops. It's like, it, 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 Ed, am I missing something? These are like four major categories of drug arrests. It's easily 90 plus percent of types of drug arrests, either so, cop runs into someone on the street, foot on foot, very, very rare. A home gets invaded because of a tip 
or a suspicion or patrol or whatever, still relatively rare. And then maybe stings like they catch you at a sale or but that's yeah. very but traffic yeah, stop. Your well, traffic relatively, stops. relatively rare, stop. relatively rare. The reason I'm sitting in this chair and not driving is because, uh, <laughs> you know, Steve, who is supposed to be the Tuesday co-host, he couldn't be here because I guess his kid made a bomb threat on a bus and the feds are now currently, as we speak, going through the wife's entire house, got it torn apart, and, you know, he's trying to console her instead of being here. I mean, it's it's not uncommon. It's starting to happen a lot to everybody because they can. Well, also now with the relative legalization of cannabis, I smelled pot no longer constitutes probable cause Right, or all the in 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 most in in a lot of the country. No, no, there was a uh, Joey yeah. shaking her head. I'm shaking my head because you smelling like weed is not probable cause to search your person. They can search your vehicle, and that's what. Oh, because sales are moving or stuff. So when you're okay, driving, keep okay. your weed in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's it. Well, uh, the interesting strategies there as things are currently shifting, but Joey. I think you would have to admit a lot less so today than in the past. We've gotten pulled over. With, I, no, 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 I'll tell you what. I got pulled over, remember, on the 40. Yeah. A few months ago in Arizona, driving home here from Flagstaff. Car smelled like weed. I had been smoking legally, just bought recreationally in Flagstaff. Got pulled over for not having a license plate. And I drive without a license or registration. It was the last time I had my license, and he kept my license. He's like, sir, do you know how suspended your license is? I'm like, I don't really care to know, but I think I got something in the mail about that maybe that I ignored. <laughs> you know? um, and did it, I, had, I had a bag from the dispensary on my dashboard. Yeah, but he didn't even mention. Now, I get your point, Joey, but in most cases – Cops don't, and, and you're right that it's not just the probable cause thing alone. Uh, Kevin Lewis, is that a bomb in your pocket? Or are you just happy to see me? See <laughs> <laughs> what you did there. Uh, but, but Joey, and in, in, in for, for local cops and state cops in states where it's legal, technically, yes, they can say, I smelled weed, probable cause you might be dealing or consuming in public, which is still technically illegal under all these state and local laws, pretty much. As far as I know, there are, are there, so there are very few many places where you can actually legally smoke weed in public, right? No, no, it's it's, it's all private or in your own home kind of yeah. stuff, right? But so so that is still hypothetical. But now it's probable cause for a citation of like drinking in public, smoking in public, like your car smelling like weed. They're not like their their motivation to use it as probable cause is like way down in petty cases like I that. just I wanna I wanna refer you to the uh, and not make people feel too safe the, with the skin color card. So, me. so yeah, it's, 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 the skin it's, color card. What it's turned me. into is the equivalent of like in a lot of states it's illegal. It's a new race in public. They don't ever mm -hmm. pull anybody for that. They're trying to get some drug dealer on something ridiculous and they got a chip on their shoulder. They will pull that stupid little card of something random that's illegal, and that's what. That's yeah, what I'm not. I'm not. Is. I'm not advising people. This is the important point of of everything Joey said. This is her protective instinct. Is that I say. You should not feel perfectly safe and comfortable just driving around in a car, uh, hot boxing your car without any sense of law enforcement. That is still an invitation for cops to fuck with you. Yeah. However. It's a lot less vicious. It's a lot less likely. And if you've just been kind of smoking pot in your car casually with the windows open, it smells a little fun most of the time. And at this point in history, cops are going to let that go. Whereas 10 years ago, yes, you're right. I'm going to fuck you. Oh, it's, like it's that, getting that's better. what it it's was. It's getting better. Right? The, the, the statistic so. is being one arrest every 50 seconds. Now it's one arrest every 56 <laughs> seconds. So, you know, yeah, we're, we're yeah. doing so good. What you're saying, what you're saying is, is, is law enforcement has lost part of its revenue stream. Yes. And, and is, and, 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 and just a relatively small part at this point, 
but it is momentum to lose a big chunk. Like, because cannabis is going to be effectively legal federally within two election cycles at this point. No fucking way it lasts that long. They're already, I mean, and it's incremental. I'm not saying, I'm not overly optimistic. Oh, they're handing out, Jim Freedom is saying people are getting DUIs for weed like candy. Yeah. Um, they just try, they still try to fuck you, just not as much, right? And that's going away. But see, there are a couple big things. I don't know if you had a DUI. I've never had a DUI. <laughs> I had an open container ticket I was able to ignore in Texas. I think I have a, I have a one county non extraditable ward in Dallas for that. <laughs> but they didn't get me for, and I probably they could have tried to get me for DUI. I think the cop was actually like, and it, it was bullshit. I was driving a rental car, and he said my plates weren't good. Uh <laughs> I could sue Avis for that and be like, you sold me, or you rented me a car. That caused me to get pulled over and get an open container ticket. It could have been worse. Uh, I don't know. I'm not going to go follow that one up. But it, self-driving cars, federal legalization of cannabis, just those two things. Let's take a bite out of crime. Those are going to make, just like George Floyd and the cell phone technology that made that case possible. We are on the cusp of, and I, you know, separate all the long-term crazy meta optimism I want to inject into this. I think it's pretty irrefutable that in the last 10 years, we have, we have witnessed and been a part of a major reduction in the brutality of the police state. And it is about to take out a chunk much bigger than that. Your contest today, sir. Uh, I'm going to go with the, uh, a suggestion that was made in the, the comment contest contest, but I'm going to put a spin on it, okay? The contest today is if you could replace one of the 10 amendments in the Bill of Rights, which one would you replace and what would you replace it with? <laughs> hmm. I that? hear the liberal trolls going, get rid of the right to bear arms. <laughs> we'll see what comes under attack. We'll see what changes. And we'll see what happens. And I think it's going to be interesting. All right. All right. We'll be checking back in with Ed uh, periodically, definitely uh, on the hour around our guests. And towards the end, it looks like we're going to have a reworking of the Constitution workshop. All right. Uh, a, that's good. Okay. Healthy disrespect. Ooh. Ooh, common con. Yeah, you're all going to be, while we're covering our econ news, looking up the uh, the amendments to the Constitution. There's some fucked up ones, uh, in the, uh, certainly in the in the later editions. Uh, but first, let's jump into our econ block with this from Bloomberg at MSN.com. Crypto shakeout stirs debate on Ether's shot at usurping Bitcoin. Usurping is one of those words, I think journalists overuse it because it's like it's really awkward to say. You don't hear it in a lot of scripts for casual videos or podcasts. But let's talk about Ether usurping Bitcoin. The relative resilience of Ether in May's cryptocurrency route has put the spotlight back on the idea that the second largest digital token could one day overtake Bitcoin by market value. Right now, the largest virtual currency is more than twice as big as Ether, but the gap narrowed by about $350 billion in May, courtesy of one of Bitcoin's worst drops and a smaller retreat in Ether. Fans of Ether cite its popularity for blockchain-based financial services and digital collectibles, as well as an ongoing upgrade to boost the efficiency of the affiliated Ethereum network. Uh, according to Tegan Klein, co-founder of blockchain software company Edge and Node, Ether will likely exceed Bitcoin at some point in the future as Ethereum will be superior when it comes to innovation and developer interest. The speed of change in the crypto sector makes prognostication perilous. Even so, Goldman Sachs Group Inc. strategists and star investor Kathy Wood are among those who highlighted Ether's potential recently. More broadly, interest in virtual currencies ex expanded out beyond Bitcoin, whose share of $1.6 trillion in total crypto market value is down 
40 down to 42 percent from about 70 percent going into 2021 <coughs> excuse me so stepping back looking at the crypto sphere when you look at the significance of either going it's not like oh my god it's only half of bitcoin like there's all these crypto competing cryptos competing the fact that any of the competing cryptos has re reached such prominence against the original is saying a number of things one that there is thoughtful enough market demand to invest in cryptocurrencies other than the big leader pineapple pizza doomer you know they made dogecoin physical use it by inserting it rectally like in the soda machine this is all the butt talk today everybody's, everybody's <laughs> got butt on the mind all right uh yeah yeah wow. anal, anal retentive crowd this morning perhaps for uh, our econ stories when you look at what that means ether versus bitcoin gives me a lot of hope i mean one it says that bitcoin is not the be all end all now i'm i'm kind of agnostic on the bitcoin versus altcoin debate um because i want people to give me money to sway me both ways uh no i genuinely intellectually like, i've heard the argument we've had guests on the show making the case for bitcoin maximalism which is the belief that hey bitcoin the first one satoshi he figured it out this is it keep it the biggest we can build off this we can lightning network we can adapt we can all these smart contracts maybe we can have other things for other functionality but when it comes to crypto is money bitcoin is it that's rough summary of what the bitcoin maximal maximalists believe crypto to the moon thank you what to do on youtube but what i'm thinking more is that while there is value to the argument for maximalists to point out how many shit coins there are out there how many scams there are i think ether well it's half as big as bitcoin has pretty well established its credibility its reliability so on and so forth so the odds of uh ether you know being the one to surpass bitcoin i don't know i mean it was invented it was developed relatively early on in this the question is how adaptable is it how long will it last as crypto develops so as the the, the general demand crypto sphere development of technologies of other services around crypto continues to expand at some point bitcoin may become obsolete and this is the scary thing and this is absolutely true regardless of whether you're a maximalist or not just because of government intervention because of potential solar flare you know if you're invested in bitcoin you have to be ready for it to go to zero at any time you have to be paying attention to sort of, i mean i i support everybody saying hey i'm just i'm gonna put a thousand dollars into crypto right now i bitcoin just took a hit bitcoin's way down and so you know Bitcoin is this, is this thing with bitcoin going to happen within a year highly 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 unlikely. much more likely that bitcoin's just going to experience another bull run and, and adjustment and bull run and adjustment and bull run and adjustment until some other altcoin whether it's ether and see i i'm skeptical that it's I, and i love ether i mean either either with all of the smart contract potential would be better money i mean if you go hey could we pick one or the other to be the currency of the future like yeah, i'd probably pick ether over bitcoin but i i don't have to pick and i'm not going to pick either because what i personally think is more likely is that when crypto matures when crypto becomes dominant global currency and who knows five years 10 years 20 30 i can't imagine it taking longer than that but on that timeline of crypto becoming dominant and fiat currency becoming a relic i think we're going to see so many more evolutions of needs for a currency that even the premises on which uh, ether and bitcoin were developed are going to shift ae able i'm not quite told on cryptos there is so many rph if there are unlimited cryptos that can be created does not dilute the value of all the other coins yes but that's why there are mathematical limits built into most crypto systems like bitcoin has a mathematical limit in its formula that limits it to shit i should know this was it 48 million coins some multiple 12 or something and and most of them have that so yes hypothetically you can create unlimited coins because anybody can just copy the code create a new network but just generating more coins they're going to be the you know shit coins that are worth 0. 0.0001 cents hypothetically 
Um, I guess what it means is that there's no scarcity of cryptocurrency. You can just make a new one, right? So in, in order for cryptocurrency to work, we have to agree to a system that has inherent scarcity in the code, the crypto, and the network. And so that does solve that problem in terms of being functional money. You can build scarcity into the code with a crypto and as money absolutely meet that function. That's not one of my concerns. But when we get, say, 10, 20 years down the road, <clears throat> our relationship with money is going to change. And I'm not trying to make some socialist, communist, you know, futuristic, whatever argument like from, you know, uh, zeitgeist. Oh, there's not, we're going to have a society without money in the future. Like, no, 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 no. But the need for money for regular exchange, like there is a human need or desire or market demand, maybe more precisely, for currency that serves as a medium of exchange in everything petty down to the size of a big lighter, All right? What, is it, what does this cost here? What does this cost at the dollar store? Less than a dollar? Dollar 80. Right? Dollar 80. To two bucks. Right. Two bucks. But when it comes to, say, hair ties, and I am I am recently become a fan of hair ties. <laughs> That's a, I get to wear my hair up now. It's really nice. It's going to keep growing. But dear, how much how much does this cost? A dollar for a twenty pack? To you, no, inflation's a thing. Inflation's <laughs> a thing. I, yeah, I thought same thing as the lighter. No, but it was. I, I got I got a twenty pack of these for about a dollar at the dollar store, right? So a nickel each. Now, if you have one of these, if you have one on your wrist, and I say I get to, I get to be like one of those long haired hippie dudes with a cool little black bracelet, you know, yeah, feels cool. Uh, but you know, women are is more thing for women, right? But dear. If someone asks you for a hair tie, do you need money to make that exchange happen? No. no. I give him a hair tie. You give him a hair tie. I give leave him a lighter. I leave all my when I have to use I give cash. Him a bowl. I put down like, yeah, three to okay. Like this is this I would not give away my studio chill because this is a very cool black and white one that has increased increased sentimental value for me every day and, but i think I, and i remember where i bought it i bought it in dispensary in california for five dollars but you get where's you have a bowl you have you have a spoon no see that's a nice this sherlock a nice, pipe beautiful and you sherlock do have pipe. we had a spoon and you dropped it and i dropped it yeah i let um it, went, was, oh. it was loaned out for the whole weekend so we just, it was, and we I just had it, it was in your i have i have like two or three like one or two dollar spoon pipes. But in, they didn't break it. I broke it. Yeah, it, you it, broke it. It came whatever. back to me. <laughs> and like 20 minutes later, it just stupidly fell in my pocket. But like <laughs> even even a joint, what does a joint cost? What does it cost to roll or a joint? Like a buck, maybe? Like a few dollars tops. Like if you buy you buy even a, a mid grade eighth at a dispensary. A buck? For $30, you get. How many joints in an eight? That's small joints. I mean, whatever. It's it's so low. By the time you roll it into a joint, it's neg negligible cost. And whether it's something manufactured or super cheap or even drugs that never should have been as expensive in the first place, this is not a product of simply those things becoming cheaper. It's also a product of the fact that humans are becoming wealthier. And we are on the cusp of superfluous material wealth. Yeah. Like, this is another beautiful thing to appreciate. We are on the cusp of abundance in food, water, clothing, energy, and shelter for every human on Earth. And I know that sounds like a pretty big goal. I know it's not going to be perfect. But we are what what is being you know human potential is exponential. And this is I, I will say this every chance I get to work it in to the narrative because it's a really important point. The, the human experience is exponential, right? And human productivity is exponential. Now clearly driven by Moore's law, which you can debate, but computing power increasing in exponential ways, which means that the value of one hour of human labor is exponential. And we are soon going to be at the point where you can work for a year. And if you save and invest carefully, you can have enough at the end of the year to support a family of four at today's expectation for quality of life for the next 50 years. By some 
estimates, we might say we're already there. It's pretty cool, right? And we get to that point. Are you are you going to be charging a dollar for a lighter at the dollar store? Is there going to be a need for that? Is it going to be like Walmart membership? You go in and you can kind of like get whatever you want. And it's just a, like, I, that's, that's the kind of stuff we're on the verge of. But let me make this point here and bring it back to reality. Because if it was some trend I was pulling out of my ass in the future and had no basis in present or past trends to justify it, it would be silly, right? Pennies. When's the last time you touched a penny? Two days ago. Okay. When was the last time you cared about a penny? I didn't care. I throw I pennies away. Yeah. I throw pennies away. I saw it on the ground. Government <laughs> spend, <laughs> government spends more to than a penny to make a penny today. Yeah. We should protest. Like that's a sign. We should protest the use of pennies <laughs> because it, uh, as U.S. currency, not not the use of decimals and accounting for dollars online. You want to be precise. Be, go down to the tenth or the hundredth of the penny. But that used to happen. There used to be major financial institutions that would calculate fractions and tenths and hundreds even of pennies on Wall Street and then round them and then tricks with like, you know, high frequency trading and things like that. But now we're like fucking round up. Like I don't I round to the dollar. I don't care for the most part. Like, do is it worth your to think about the time and energy? And here's here's another point. Like, is, is it, so there's no, there's no demand for pennies. We don't use pennies. We don't carry pennies. We don't pay for stuff in pennies, but we don't think about pennies anymore. At least here as privileged citizens of the empire in the United States of America. We don't think of hair ties as like, oh, well, we need nickels. We need our government to issue nickels so that we have a, a money so that we can exchange hair ties. <laughs> Psychic taxi, one entry per person uh, in today's comment contest. Oh, there, there are a lot of, I, article one, article two, your first amendment, third amendment. You're not going to guess the right answer now. Do we want thought, good, thoughtful answers? I think, but funny for today's comment contest. So look at this as an example. This hair tie for a nickel. No, you buy like a supply. I buy. I for me, as a amateur ponytail enthusiast, uh, <laughs> we are. Like, I, I don't buy these a nickel at a time and go, ooh, it's costing a nickel. Let me account for that in my budget. As a dollar for 20, I don't even think about that. It's, oh, what would, I spent $80 at the dollar store and I got excessive stuffs of dollar store stuff that I need for home comfort. I hate this how my hair does this thing. Maybe I, maybe I, maybe I should use this hair tie. So look, is, that, is that better? Fabulous. Get rid of, we'll get, see, I never thought that an econ block talking about crypto would lead me to once again, changing my hairstyle live on the air. But I'm, I'm like, I like showing up my ponytail now, except it doesn't work on the show when it's this frontal shot all the time. But yeah, look, I have, I have a real ponytail. And it's, it's, I can wear it as a top knot or a man bun too. Maybe tomorrow if you ask nicely. So back to ether and crypto. The recent shifts in the market valuation of Ether versus crypto, I think, are most significantly represented by this number of Bitcoin going from 70% to 42% of the total $1.6 trillion of crypto out there. Mike Freeman, one of our best chatters. I wish I could super chat $20 in pennies just to be an asshole. <laughs> oh, is that, hey, by the way, don't you have my mailing address, Jim, on the uh, on the Chirons there? P.O. Box 973, Fork, Arizona, 86320. <laughs> send me pennies. Yeah. Yeah. All you contrarian assholes out there. Send me, send me, send me pennies. If I had a, you know what I would do with pennies though? Like, dear, this is seriously, this is what I want to collect pennies for. It's for art. Yeah. They're more right. they're more useful as art. Like they're and worth more that way than they are in their form at the grocery store. Yeah, if you can sit down and make art with like, and there's some like I've seen a there's a restaurant in DC where the floor is pennies. 
Yeah, I've seen. So they had like a, a crude, some kind of crude a floor surface, and, and then glued pennies on in a pattern, and then um, on top of that, a an, an epoxy, like a hard clear epoxy. And it looks really cool. Those tables, melt them down, make cool stuff. The copper is worth more than a penny, isn't it? How yeah. much is the copper in a penny worth? Uh, <laughs> Rob B has to point out it would cost him $100 to mail $20 in pennies. It's going to be. <coughs> no, 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 no. I'd pay a parking Thanks ticket to that way. It'd be worth it. How, how many pennies could you fit? In a USPS flat rate box, and would it not exceed the weight limit at that point? Because that would be twenty dollars to send in two days anywhere in the United States. I, I mean, there's, 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 I, I see. Like, I, I kind of grew up with the hacker mentality. I mean, I read a little. Was it twenty six hundred? You know, um, that's a real esoteric reference for like eighties hackers. Yeah. Um, well, back when there was a magazine for hackers, remember that when like paper was still relevant in the computer world. Being um, a hacker was cool. Being a hacker was cool. Yeah. Um, what was I saying about that back then? Magazines for hackers. Yeah, but before that, I was making a point about something. Uh, yeah. So I oh my mentality. So when I hear about like you could mail. Like, what's the weight limit of USB? Like, could we could we milk the inefficiencies of the system for personal gain? <laughs> could you could you somehow profit from sending stuff by flat rate that's now like steel? Yeah, here's so like flat rate priority shipping. I don't think it's gone up much, and certainly government when government has taken on a service like that. It uh, is building in some inefficiency supported by tax dollars. And it's generally slower to react to market forces than it should be. Like, given the coming inflation, current inflation, given the skyrocketing commodity prices, steel, wood, etc., USPS should be jacking up their flat rate priority mail rates proportionally. Because gas, oh, price of gas for delivery, of course, for the, for, the, for the actual delivery of the mail. And I'm sure it's gone up a lot already. But I'm wondering if there's like, could we mail steel to each other and somehow beat the game? You know, and, and, and more importantly, if we figured out what we would technically be doing, would be exploiting an inefficiency in the postal service. And I'm not saying this is actually real or practical, but for example, if they only updated their prices once a year and we went, oh shit, right before. It hits, you know, let's let and now that halfway through that year, steel and wood have gone up so much. And, you know, we can mail stuff cheaper using USPS and take advantage of that inefficiency. And then USPS is sort of contractually forced to deliver those packages with increased vehicle maintenance, driver and gas costs. You could crash USPS, you know, by just exploiting an inefficiency like that. Makes sense, right? It would be a um, a fun protest act, but you'd probably get locked up for it for something silly, mail fraud, or so. Is at, steel on the list of things you can't? Oh, was, I'm sure it would be illegal, but there'd be some. Oh, <laughs> well, is it illegal to just ship a bunch of stuff and patronize the government mail service? Um, psychic taxi Edways in pre 1981 pennies are worth two and a half cents worth of copper. <laughs> pre 1981. So like that's the thing is like unless you're melting down your coins, like it, it, holding pennies, thinking about pennies. But back to the main point here, like in your personal life, and I, I try to be aware of this. I mean, I attribute my success to you know certain certain life hacks, I guess, and, and one of them is just I, I see people worrying over pennies, and it's like you know I. What is it? Uh, penny wise, pound foolish. And there's a lot of that just in like basic modern American lifestyles that are conditioned into us where, oh, well, you got to clip your coupons. I know that's not, I grew up in the 80s. That was a thing for my mom. You know, clip your coupons. And it's like, 
spend half an hour going you know, every Sunday going through the coupon section yeah. of, of, I think it was a San Francisco Chronicle we read in the Bay Area and clip out coupon. And it's like, versus spend half an hour with your kids. And I don't know, maybe that's some people, and, and for some, like there was this point where coupons were a legit thing that it's like, yeah, if you did it, that was smart shopping to Double a certain coupon degree. Day, yeah. Whatever, like there was, but what was that? It was a trick. It was a trick by stores to get people to buy more and take advantage of it. So you could, if they, like the, the corporate mentality in retail is if we can generate interest, trick people to come in into our store more, we can genuinely, so it's we're going to keep the lot. deal the same for the random people who wander into Safeway. For people who are paying attention, we can give them a 20% discount and it's worth it if they're smart to get that with coupons. But we're going to make that up with the 10% who are dumb and end up spending way, spending way more and are now loyal, locked in customers to Safeway because they're not, they're, they don't see the, the full cost benefit analysis. So like taxi, a copper penny can replace a $2 screw in fuse. <laughs> There's always that. That, yes. that makes it. So, work like, yeah, we should be collecting copper pennies here. See, this is maybe this is how we crash the system. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. This isn't practical. Don't get too excited. <laughs> what if we all just went and got pennies from banks? Like emptied the banks of their penny supply, you mean? And figured out a way to melt them down and monetize it better and Just be like, hey, government, government is doing this hugely inefficient thing with copper making coins that are worth, that cost more than a penny to make and contain more than a penny's worth of copper. If you could take a dollar, preferably that you got from some welfare program, they're not copper. To take it away to go. But they're not as copper, but they're still copper. And it still costs more than a penny to make. Yeah. Right. And this is kind of happening with COVID anyway. COVID has already got us on a coin short. Now, crashing the penny system <laughs> doesn't seem like necessarily worth the activism organizing effort to begin with. A lot of work. <laughs> and at some point, banks can just say, fuck you, we're out of pennies, go away. Or like, limit up, like, we, we, sorry, retail customers, we don't give you pennies anymore. We only give pennies to, to retail businesses that need them for their cash register. There are 130 billion pennies. 130 in billion pennies currently in circulation. So that's a lot to collect. 716 million pounds of pennies. But no, it We're wouldn't take much food. of a national effort of let's go buy pennies to, you know, like GameStop, like the GameStop activism of crashing the system, right? Now, here's a better idea that's related to this, at least same, same principle. When we were at Anarchapulco, Elijah mentioned this last weekend. There was a guy uh, who had done some jail time giving a presentation saying that if we could raise a few million dollars and organize legal support and incentivize with cash bribes people facing plea deals to not take a plea, we could crash the legal system to the point where they only get to persecute victim, uh, real victims' crimes. Like, you go, yeah, that, yeah, if someone wants to organize that, that would work. I'm thinking, is there a similar, because he gave, he gave an hour long presentation on this and like closed all the gaps and was like, yep, that's it. That's, you know, absolutely. Um, but it would, it was, I think like a 10, $20 million effort to, and, and the legal system will adapt, but to put this pressure on the legal system right now, I think it'd be a huge effort, Yeah, you know, support. And it's not like, oh, we're throwing some people into the fire as cannon fodder. It's like, no, we're using we're we're rewarding them appropriately for like, hey, you might do a few years time. You're taking on that risk. Well, you know, here's here's serious financial compensation for that time that makes it worth it for you. If we could just fund the people who are in those situations and get them appropriate legal support, and just be like, yeah, if you don't take a plea, we're going to give you ten grand. How many people would do that? And then like you do. Imagine worst case scenario, you do three months and a year's probation. You go, fuck yeah, it was worth it for ten grand. You know, and you maybe it's more. Yeah. No, no, no. This is a private company giving you 10 grand incentive to not Dude. take a plea. So, yes, yeah, hypothetically, totally. do you have to report it for taxes? We'll find a way to give it to that you in that crypto. Is, you know? Intimidating the witness or something. They wouldn't let it happen. They wouldn't let it happen. They find out about it. And, oh, and they, the yeah, they find a way to soon. make it yeah. illegal. I know, I know, the, company. the company wouldn't be allowed to give that money to somebody. Like, isn't that witness intimidation or something that falls? 
within some sort of wouldn't be intimidation but i get what you're saying like jury tampering it would be like witness but i'm gonna give you ten thousand dollars if you don't take a plea i think you're pretty safe in that all right we got a lot more stories about all these fun sidebars 50 minutes into the show now just talking about ether and and bitcoin not that it wasn't time very very well spent just going to check on our calendar to see what we have for guests updated and it looks like we still don't have any guests on the calendar for today so um not on the calendar <coughs> so maybe not confirmed or scheduled but hopefully we get ashley on here but for now moving ahead to articles wall street journal um, and this is total. This is another sidebar. Like I should be getting into the next big econ stories first, but this is like, as an animal lover and you know, vegetarian veganish guy, this is a really cool story. Wall Street Journal: A technology race to stop the mass killing of baby chicks. We're not talking about baby Chinese chicks. Uh, we're talking about chicks uh, like baby chickens. Although yeah. we do want to save the future chicks of china who are getting killed as babies and aborted due to the one child thought it's a really gruesome turn that into a gruesome joke didn't we no an an estimated six billion newly hatched male chicks are killed worldwide each year new technologies are being developed to stop that and it's like six so if you didn't know and I'll, i'll summarize this story pretty quickly if you didn't know yeah six billion and it's hatcheries that do this they take eggs hatch chicks and then they gender them i guess gender is applying a gender sex them is to determine their gender and then or determine their sex i guess i'm I'm parsing the parsing the terminology wrong here but you get my point and what they do is uh they take the male chicks and throw them into a grinder live. Yeah, I've seen these videos. And, and unfortunately. Robbie, who needs so many roosters? Right. And so it's because male chickens don't lay eggs in the the, well, the way that, it, and, and I would think let's, I, maybe let's continue the domestication process of chickens and breed them to birth 90% female eggs or something like that, right? Is, it, is, is that really that difficult for us to, with selective breeding with chickens to have accomplished at this point? Or uh, breed, it so, breed them so that the males lay eggs? But based on chickens having been domesticated from wild, what, did they, what were they domesticated from? Whatever the wild version of chickens were. They had a gender balance, right? Most farmers consider them meat birds. Uh, but they're not. The, the males can't even be meat birds because they're not efficient for that um, compared to birds that are bred and, and, and raised for meat, which is a whole other cruel thing because they breed chickens to have cool. chicken breasts that are so the, 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 the pectoral muscle, right, I think, is so enlarged that it creates a physically impractical bird that is just like born as a freak and oh then God. and then put in a cage because they've been genetically modified not genetically modified but bred so that they produce as much meat as fast as possible as meat birds and talk about what is a meat bird chicken that is a whole other disgusting proposition right now of all the things that we do so so if you're if you're an animal over there well i'm a vegetarian i just eat eggs if you're getting mass-produced eggs that come from this, even farm-raised, free range, just know that you are contributing to the mass murder of baby male chicks. And like that's fine. Like of all the of all of the sins of humanity, pretty small, even six billion. But there is something that it, to our humanity revolts us about six billion. We are creating six billion lives. Simple print. It's not like, oh, bacteria in my gut. I created six million today and then I pooped them out. No, like birds that feel pain as chicks. And we, I, I, I think, want to avoid making that part of what we do of injecting that pain into the world, that suffering. And it's even there, it's not that much. A lot of them are killed by gas, right? A lot of them are killed. Uh, the thrown into the grinders, it's gross. But even that, 
Like if you told me, Adam, you're going to live to a hundred and then be thrown into a giant grinder where your consciousness ceases in like two seconds, I'd be like, well, it's kind of gruesome, but of all the deaths out there, I'll take it. You know, like you guarantee that hypothetical. Sure. But now you go, why can't we avoid this uh, psychic or they breed female only chicks? Why don't they know how to breed female only humans? <laughs> Uh, well, China has figured out how to be, breed male-only humans. You institute a one-child policy, and then the uh, the parents kill the girls themselves. Uh, yeah, if you want to look into that. The 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 statistics on the the effect from the one-child child policy in China are uh, uh, pretty pretty gruesome and on a whole other level compared to what we're talking about with chicks here. <clears throat> but what they've done now is developed a technology to sex eggs before they are hatched so we don't have to create that life it's just the embryo and the egg the genetic material we can go all right you're a boy you're an omelet you're a girl you're an egg layer and at least that is uh progress in technology making the world more humane another meat econ story before we get to our main econ headlines this is from bloomberg at yahoofinance.com Meat is latest cyber victim as hackers hit top supplier JBS. Yes. Psychic Tech News last China's now on a three child. Yeah, I know, I know China is now on a three child policy. But if you look back to when they had the one child policy in effect, it's um it it they they had to get away from it. It was it was uh Maybe we should do an in-depth coverage of just China's one-child policy, how it got instituted, and how it evolved to today. Craig, Adam, you need some chickens and gardenia. We need a caretaker. Um, and this is the unfortunate reality right now. I mean, we've got Ed and Pat and Joey and myself living here full-time, but none of us are here consistently enough to say we are 100% responsible for living systems. I want to get gardens going and 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 birds and it all it takes is is the person here to be responsible and um i know we could design you know lower maintenance systems than, than daily checks kinds of things we're actually uh with the help of a friend in in anticipation of home front battle buddies retreats designing a uh, a wallapini would be an underground greenhouse uh with that's i mean it's still not entirely passive and this is you know yeah you want things to be as efficient as possible but you're talking about putting food in your body and participating in the food production. There's a certain amount of attentiveness that is, is appropriate in that no matter how, I mean, you can automate uh, chicken food dispensers, but at some point every, every day you have to have a human going in there collecting eggs or at least, at least every other day, every three days, I think you can get away with, um, you know, less on any kind of scale. And, uh, you know, you can automate chicken watering systems and food systems. But if you're going to be responsible for, for life that way, uh, you know, oversight and backups and reliability needs to be maintained. 1054, I was a lot happier before this discussion. <laughs> oh, it's like the Kyle Kinane joke. I am one Netflix documentary away from becoming a vegetarian. <laughs> All right, so back to this story. Bloomberg, the world's biggest meat suppliers, become the latest casualty of a cybersecurity attack, posing a fresh threat to global food security already rattled by the COVID-19 pandemic. JBS SA shut its North American Australian computer network after an organized assault on Sunday on some of its servers, the company said by email, without commenting on operations at its plants. JBS said the incident may delay certain transactions with customers and suppliers. The attack sidelined two shifts, halted processing at one of Canada's largest meat packing plants, while the company canceled all beef and lamb kills across Australia. Industry website Beef Central said some kill and fabrication shift have also been canceled in the US, according to a union Facebook post. Now about meat versus you know uh, plant-based diets in general, um, I understand evolution of the brain would not have occurred without access to protein at that point in human evolution. I would suggest that since then we have developed the agricultural and nutritional understanding to say we don't need meat to be healthy. In fact, it, we have better ways of getting the complete nutritional profile of amino acids through plants 
that we get from that we in the past would have only been able to get from meat, and therefore there was a legitimate essential like and kind of kill or be killed of eating meat in the past. But at this point, here's what it comes down to: killing an animal for meat, even though you're eating it, you need it, and that's that's sort of a righteous use of that animal. When you can be just as healthy or healthier by not eating that meat. What that means is you are killing that animal for pleasure or essentially outsourcing that job, which might be worse, right? Paying someone to kill an animal for pleasure. You go, Adam, it's for survival. It's not for survival if you could survive on plants or eggs and dairy. Just to talk about meat, just eliminate the meat part, the murder part. Let's let's have symbiotic. And I I believe we can have friendly, appropriate, nap compliant uh, relationships with animals by which we get animal products. I'm not I'm not that like hardcore vegan can't touch animal products. That's kind of silly. We're animals. We grew up with animals. We use animals. We have other animals inside our bodies. You know, um, Kevin Lewis. The difference between a liberal and a libtard. Libtards say don't kill animals. Get me to the store where they make it. I swear I have heard this. Yeah. I, there are so many, and, and I, I will say also that I am a promoter. I, I'm not. I'm not down on how we do meat currently, except for the poisoning, the inhumanity, and the government intervention that leads to, to so many other problems. But just how we do meat right now, I'm not like down on it. It's a product of human evolution. We went from, you know, uh, endurance hunting, spears and knives to you know, uh, organized hunting to agriculture with meat to, you know, more comprehensive industrialized agriculture where most people have no idea where their food comes from. And like, that's fine. That in and of itself, an evolution. But even today, there's there's a drive towards more thoughtful consumption in that system of food. And that's amazing. And then that there's this next level of, well, let's produce our own food. Oh, let's have an eat and grow pod. And we're not at the point where it's cheap for everybody yet. But let's get an eat and grow pod where it sucks moisture out of the air and it takes electricity from the sun to run the whole thing and put lights inside a contained system. I just get to walk in and pull out whatever I want for my beautiful garden of Eden in a shipping container. <clears throat> At some point, uh, meat is going to be obsolete. And already today, the impossible Whopper is better than the regular Whopper. <laughs> yeah, fuck you. We have gotten to that point, ground meat and burger patties the plant-based versions are better, at least for my taste. I, the the mouthfeel, the, the 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 texture, the 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 satisfaction of it, and then it's healthier. Like, why would you eat meat? Because it's it's cool. Because you had to. Like, there's there's just no reason. And I'm not even. I I can't even say I'm a strict vegetarian. I'm a consumer choice, vegan-ish, whatever, who sees this spectrum of consciousness and wants to move in a better direction. For my health and the planet and for everybody else. Joey cooks meat out here. I'll eat it. If there's leftovers, if it's going to waste, I eat meat. I'm not trying to say, oh, look at me. I don't eat meat. And I'm Bob. No, like I eat minimal meat just by course of being around other people. If someone made me a meal, I wouldn't turn it down. If they made it's I will always ask for a vegetarian option. Uh I and I will never I I've actually since I since I did this, I will say I have been. 99 plus percent perfectly strict on i don't buy meat that's that's a really easy and i encourage everybody not to adopt my standards but to consider the reason behind it and now that you see that now you know why some hackers might be pissed and hack jbs and take advantage of this opportunity to accelerate that process and for for people who see that killing an animal for pleasure even if you're eating it is murder can't blame them for taking more extreme measures in it all right, now let's see. What do we have on the calendar? Is the calendar updated? Uh, we have a guest two, backstage. Two, two, we have a guest backstage, but I need their information. I, I really don't know who our guest is if it's not on the calendar. I don't want to. It's not. It's still not on the calendar. I have Ed's calendar, and I don't see uh, a guest entry. So I, I want to do this wrong, and I apologize to our guests if they got backstage before we did this. Um, but I. I I need to know what I need to know for a respectful, proper introduction, introduction here. All right. So 
I, I, I don't know how that's going to happen. We, I know we have like three or four people <clears throat> trying to make this interview happen. We will get to it. I'm going to get to a few more econ stories and see if we check back in. Wall Street Journal. Battle brews over banning natural gas to homes. Cities are considering, oh, like, this is a confusing headline, right? How do we parse this up? Cities are considering measures to phase out gas hookups amid climate concerns spurring some states to outlaw such prohibitions. A growing fight is unfolding again across the U.S. as cities consider phasing out natural gas for home cooking and heating. Citing concerns about climate change and states pushed back against these bans. Major cities, including San Francisco, Seattle, Denver, and New York, have either enacted or proposed measures to ban or discourage the use of fossil fuel in new homes and buildings two years after Berkeley, California, passed the first such prohibition in the U.S. in 2019. The bans in turn led Arizona, Texas, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Kansas, and Louisiana to enact laws outlawing such municipal prohibitions in their states before they can spread, arguing that they are overt, overly restrictive and costly. Ohio is considering a similar measure. And this is where, like, we invent toothbrushes. Government comes in and elects vermin supreme and mandatory toothbrushing, and now government takes credit for everybody brushing their teeth. Well, no, you live in California. We don't need to do natural gas. We have better heating alternatives. We can live with this. We can wear a sweater inside a couple weeks a year and sweats for pajamas. and rather than deal. And if a city as a community decides to do that, I feel like they should have the ability to do that. Right. And, and it's not like as a government, it's not legitimate. There are a lot of problems with it being a government run city, but cities as approximations of communities carrying out policies that reflect the majority of people who have agreed to live in city limits. Like, you know, that's fine. And so States now coming in to do this, Interesting. I did not expect to see this, though, that new houses, cities banning new houses from having propane or natural gas going into them. That's that's an interesting battleground we're going to have to come back to. Telegram. Telegram. You're right. On Telegram. Well, on my Telegram. Telegram. This is backstage. The information you need. Okay, Joey has this, um, but there's no website, and it's not on the calendar. So we're going to work on that after the show. It, Ed, where's Ed? Ed is, Ed is behind his laptop, like right over there. I thought that was how we were doing this. No? Me up. Is that happening today? I was going to say, bring me up, Adam. <laughs> All right. Welcome back. Well, hey, Ed, definitely before we get to the guests, we should check in with our co host in the comment contest. I haven't seen, I've seen a lot of fun comments. I haven't seen a lot of this article or this amendment well this is a little bit of a different contest adam as you can imagine but we do have a very clear front runner i mean we have five basic entries and you know i could read them all off and they'll all be what you'd expect replace the ninth with the government is a prohibitive opening property or or changing the money so i can make my own currency without being it's just stuff like that but clear winner i'll just read it 1054 so far is in the lead. He said, change the 10th Amendment by removing the small print at the end that just says, psych! <laughs> All right, hold on. Now I got I to pull up the text of the 10th Amendment. Because, uh, yeah, the uh, 10th Amendment has like a clause at the end that's like, meh. Um, yeah, that yeah. these aren't these aren't just the rights. There are that you have unlimited rights that you any sort of thing you can think of. This is just the restrictions on these rights, and that's it. That's all the Tenth Amendment is. I mean, so it's, the just, Tenth Amendment reads: the powers not delegated to right. the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states, respectively. Or to the people. It's sort of showing the illegitimacy of, by the way, we if we delegate more rights to ourselves, and we can just delegate more rights to ourselves at any time. But you're, this is generally presented. It's interesting how you flip this today, or the commenter flip this, because typically the Tenth Amendment is considered by libertarian leaning constitutional scholars as a check on the power and say, Hey, if we didn't put it here, it belongs to the people. 
And it's sort of like, oh, you're giving me my rights because you haven't delegated them to yourself yet. Yes, those are still my rights. What about the ones you just took? Right? And that's that's an interesting way of looking at this language and pointing out that it really, I because I've never parsed it this way, but the way that you're suggesting now certainly fits it more accurately into the narrative of the coup of 1789 being the coup against the articles and go, oh yeah, they put the first 10 amendments in as the bill of rights to easier force it down people's throats. Yeah. Assuagement basically. Um, the, our, our guest this afternoon is Ashley shade. I believe, you know, Ashley, I do, uh, but does, does Ashley have a, a website I can introduce her with you know, that she would like to promote she's here? Under, she's really under the weather. She won't be on camera, but she will be there for the for the voice interview, and, and she she's really, she's pretty sick. All right, all right. Well, then let's get to Ashley right now, not keep her waiting anymore. Ashley. No, 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 no. We, we, we have her on. She was she showed up and we said no come back in 30 minutes we got you booked for this so she's going to be on time and oh, she's the uh, outright libertarian chair okay Great. all right let's see how much econ we can cover in the next 27 minutes um all right so back to the headlines bloomberg once text golden child apple loses its luster as scrutiny grows pressured over its app store and its handling of customer data Apple can no longer sidestep the criticism directed at peers like Amazon and Facebook. Apple Inc. CEO Tim Cook might not have shared the values of Donald Trump, but he knew how to get his ear. Well, the CEOs of Facebook Inc. and Alphabet Inc. Google faced accusations of anti-Republican bias in Amazon.com Inc. Jeff Bezos openly feuded with the former president. Cook dined with Trump at his Bedminster, New Jersey golf club <clears throat> and cultivated relationships with his children the payoff when cook had a problem he needed only to pick up the phone others go out and hire very expensive consultants and tim cook's tim cook calls donald trump directly trump said in august 2019 speaking in the third person whenever there's a problem he'll call however it's out now and tim's problems don't just require consultants but expensive lawyers and there's a lot more going on with lawsuits hitting uh, hitting Apple right now. And it, it, it there was, a, under Steve Jobs, I mean, there was this sort of like peak of Apple, like the laptops were on. I mean, you, you remember this, Joey, right? Apple products were hot from the invention of, uh, or the creation development of the iPod, right? It was the iPod. Holy shit, Apple makes iPods. Right, and then it was the, and then the the development of their computer business, and then laptops. They became like a, just a top of the line thing, and it was dominant in video editing. And I knew this as an unfortunate thing because I didn't like the the Apple OS. Uh, I didn't like the, the 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 layout, the concept, the workflow. I get it. I've used apples. I've owned apples. I've worked in the Apple OS for several years during that time, but. Uh, then, then the iPhone, and now, now the iPhone is still dominant. But look at how its business has transitioned so much from making computers and small electronic devices to really focusing on the iPhone, which is a planned obsolescence device. People don't like that about the iPhone. Do you know? Do you know anybody who has an iPhone, Joey? Do we know anybody? I we do. were all. We're I know all like three people, Android and I think zero. they're all nerds, but they're not here. They're not in the club. <laughs> They're not a club. So people who try to get me on Clubhouse, there's like an Apple exclusive social media site. My 11 year old will like, go off on rants on how bad Apple is, just out of nowhere, too. Just is it at that point? Well, it's not now because he's now Apple having shifted from being a great device maker has now, thanks to corporatism, succumbed to now. Okay, now your best device is the phone, and you're gonna you're gonna engineer now the planned obsolescence, which is interesting, and it is is engineered into the software. It's, it's, it's almost like a natural product of the technology because you have this phone, it has this software, this hardware capacity, and then you come out with a new phone that's got twice the processing power, and now you can do a game on it that you couldn't do on the old phone. And now 
It's not like the old phone is obsolete. It still does, but it oh, just doesn't play the new game that's on a cooler new phone with twice with double processing power. And you, okay, well, Adam, game, simple example, but okay, Google Sheets, Google Docs, uh, Google Browser, just web browsing. Like when it got to all of those things and those functionalities, now it's like, oh, you have a two generation old iPhone, you poor deprived child. You know, because then you just can't even. And what Apple was doing was way more manipulative than what I'm suggesting is natural built into the system. There was a time they started fucking with people with systems updates. The very system upgrade that your phone needed, your iPhone needed to stay on the system was now burdensomely large for your hard drive. You know, oh, your phone is slow. Well, you just, it's, it still works as promised. You just, you just have to get the upgrade now. And it feels like since then, and the death of Steve Jobs, Apple has been poised <clears throat> for a decline based on, well, I mean, one, losing that key visionary, Steve, Steve Jobs, and guiding Apple, but sort of having outlived its usefulness or shift, allowed itself to have shifted from the, that core functionality to all these other things where, you know, you look at Apple's revenue, a big chunk of it now comes from services in the App Store. And things that like this is why the big fight is over software technology and government policy, not hey, we make the best devices. Patrick Lewis is the Vax tech controlled by Apple. Uh, no, but pretty soon I hear there's going to be an app on your phone for Apple users exclusively that you, you put on your wrist and it shoots a needle out of the base of the phone into your arm with whatever government wants injected in you at the time. Yeah, right. Uh, but there is, I, I do, do Apple users tend trend towards more statist. There was always something about, um, I mean, I get it. You want your computer used to be simple for whatever reason, but I trust the authorities to manage my system as opposed to, I want to be hands-on like with a windows based PC or Linux, or even something more open source than that. Yeah. All right. So Apple might be coming down on those peaks. The guardian on Yahoo finance, Silicon six tech giants accused of inflating tax Payments by almost one hundred billion dollars. <throat> oh, you pay your taxes? Well, not if you're one of these. The giant U.S. tech firms, known as the Silicon Six, have been accused of inflating their stated tax payments by almost one hundred billion dollars over the past decade. As Chancellor Rishi Sunak called on world leaders to back a new tech tax ahead of next week's G7 summit in the UK, a report by the campaign group Fair Tax Foundation singled out Amazon, Google, Facebook's owner Alphabet, Netflix, Apple, and Microsoft. It said they paid $96 billion less in tax between 2011 and 2020 than the notional tax figures they cite in their annual financial reports. Mm. Is this going to lead to a bigger feud between the tech giants created by government corporatism and the governments they are supposedly paying off for their protection services? Or perhaps just another renegotiation of terms? We'll see. Wall Street Journal, Amazon faced 75,000 arbitration demands. Now it says, fine, sue us. The retail giant is no longer steering customers away from the court system. As companies scramble to find ways to avoid lawyers who file mass arbitration claims, companies have spent more than a decade forcing employees and customers to resolve disputes outside the traditional court system using secretive arbitration proceedings that typically don't allow plaintiffs to team up and extract big money payments akin to a class action. And this is this is a weird thing for a libertarian to look at because mandatory arbitration like seeking re re you know, a recourse outside the courts, generally a good thing. Let's create competition to government as dispute resolution services and in a lot of ways, very good overall. <coughs> also, primarily driven by corporations looking to exploit people and saying, well, we'll only sign a contract with you if you agree to this mandatory arbitration clause, which says, unless certain possible criteria are met, you can't actually sue us in a government court. You can't use government against us. And there's some cases today where, yeah, using government is the is the best way to achieve actual justice. Corporations use this to avoid that justice. And now the tide has changed again for Amazon, where they're like, no, 
we, you can't even use the government court system effectively against us. Fuck it. Go ahead. Sue me. DNYUZ.com. Big economic story. How the world ran out of everything. Yeah, like the world. Everything. Did you notice that? The world ran out of everything. Slight dramatization, obviously. And the story <coughs> excuse me, of how the modern world was constructed. Toyota stands out as the mastermind of a monumental advance in industrial efficiency. The Japanese automaker pioneered so-called just-in-time manufacturing. Ah, excuse me. In which parts are delivered to factories right as they are required, minimizing the need to stockpile them. Over the last half century, this approach has captivated global business in industries far beyond autos, from fashion to food processing to pharmaceuticals. Companies have embraced just-in-time to stay nimble, allowing them to adapt to changing market demands while cutting costs. But the tumultuous events of the past year have challenged the merits of pairing inventories while reinvigorating concerns that some industries have gone too far, leaving them vulnerable to disruption. As the pandemic has hampered factory operations and sown chaos in global shipping, many economies around the world have been bedeviled by shortages of a vast range of goods from electronics to lumber to clothing. In a time of extraordinary upheaval in the global economy, just in time is running late. I hope that makes it clear enough, but to summarize, in the quest for efficiency, we have made supply chains much leaner in the sense that things don't sit around in warehouses. It's we're gonna build this and we can now coordinate the time so it's manufactured into this process. And this is good for overall efficiency. This is a de development of manufacturing, industrialization, all positive in and of itself. The problem is in a world of government and fluctuating needs, this does create a vulnerability. Now, naturally, market demand and supply would create a balance, market forces overall, would create a balance between this desire for uh, absolute efficiency and safety or security and the reliability of those supply chains. So, for example, if you have a, a, a supply chain that's vulnerable to storms, like no matter what, you have raw materials that you're going to pull out of the ground two months before you need to turn them into steel, one month before you need to roll them into sheep, one month before they need to be pressed into parts, one month before they need to be assembled into an auto so that one month later, they can be delivered to the showroom floor, right? That's that's the kind of just in time. My time estimates are probably totally off, but you get the point is that there's that course of what just in time makes possible. But if you have a vulnerability where, hey, a rainstorm means that your mines are going to be lowering production every now and then, there's a fluctuation that is predictable based on natural forces. <coughs> that would naturally be built into the system right or if in on the road from your you know uh, raw material to uh, pure uh, metals if there's a you know there's a washout on that road you know once a month in a horrible storm or there's the rain is too bad the truck can't come that day well then you build in an appropriate buffer in your supply chain to compensate for those natural fluctuations every step along the way. And then you get to an actually perfectly efficient, just in time manufacturing system that takes advantage of all of the coordination techniques that we have developed over the years. But it's not just rainstorms and random roads you got to worry about. It's, well, what if government decides there's going to be a forced unemployment crisis because of a pandemic? Whoops. What if regulations change? What if there's a war? All of these things that prevent us from creating a more efficient, just-in-time manufacturing supply chain to you know, manufacturing to retail, everything delivery supply chain is the inefficiencies and the fluctuations of government policies, wars of policy, because they interfere with the smoothness and they create more than just the natural variables that have to be accounted for. And so because of this massive period of government disruption interrupting the supply chain, they're going to try to blame it on, oh, it's just in time being too vulnerable. It's the companies being stretched. Then it's like, 
No, not in this case. <coughs> Excuse me. Washington Post at GreenwichTime.com. One-way companies are concealing higher prices, smaller packages. Consumers are paying more for a growing range of household staples in ways that don't show up on receipts. Thinner rolls, lighter bags, smaller cans, as companies took, look to offset rising labor and material costs without scaring off customers. It's a form of retail camouflage known as shrinkflation. And economists and consumer advocates who track packaging expected to become more pronounced as inflation ratchets up, taking hold of such everyday items such as paper towels, potato chips, and diapers. Uh, according to Edgar Dworsky, consumer advocate, former assistant attorney general in Massachusetts, who has been tracking product sizes for more than 30 years, quote, consumers check the price every time they buy, but they don't check the net weight. When the price of raw materials like coffee beans or paper pulp goes up, manufacturers are faced with a choice. Do we raise the price knowing consumers will see it and grumble about it, or do we give them a little bit less and accomplish the same thing? Often it's easier to do the latter. And some of the uh, the trickery in this is that you can use like the same size coffee can. It's just, oh, instead of half an inch cap at the top, now there's two inches you have at the top. Mike Freeman, what happens if there's a trucker strike? It would shut down everything at once. Yes, and there have been various limited attempts <clears throat> at trucker strikes uh, over the past three years. Uh, someone actually proposed us uh, from, from a trucker activism group uh, doing a blockade on D.C. as an end the Fed uh, point to support the the uh, campaign uh, for Kokesh 2020. So to this downsizing, yeah, look out. Um, so here's a funny example, though. Uh, for Michael Jewsbury, shrinkflation arrived in the form of cat food. Without warning, late last year, a standard order for Royal Canine was filled with 5.1 ounce cans instead of the usual 5.9, but Chewy.com's provider continued to charge him the same $81 for his bi-weekly order. Both he and a 16-year-old cat, Maurice, immediately noticed. It just showed up at my doorstep in a smaller size. And uh, he said that this is going to cost him $240 a year in order to do that. There was no explanation, no notification. It really bugged me. Yeah, and Royal Canine, uh, or Canine, a subsidiary of the packaged goods giant Mars, Inc., said it reduced some product sizes to keep up with unprecedented demand for pet food during the pandemic, including the wet mix of rabbit liver and pea flour that Jewsbury purchased for his now-deceased Russian blue. Apparently, she was so stressed out. May she rest in peace. Uh, may the rest of you rest assured knowing that inflation is here and you are going to have to deal with it one way or another. Don't let them trick you this way. And it's not, uh, it's not fraudulent, but it is somewhat deceptive. If you are not notified, if you are, you know, a purchaser of something on a subscription, you go, wait a second, I'm a cat food subscriber here too. Uh, I have an Amazon subscription for um, a monthly delivery for cat food for the scorpion cats of Gardenia. And if they just suddenly started showing up smaller, I, I, I would be checking. I would, I would notice. Um, related a story on uh, consumerism from BloombergQuint.com. Instacart wants to replace army of gig shoppers with robots. Bloomberg Instacart Inc. has an audacious plan to replace its army of gig shoppers with robots, part of a long-term strategy to cut costs and put its relationships or its relationship with supermarket chains on a sustainable footing. And this is one example, but it makes you wonder with, uh, you know, uh, with uh, Uber and Lyft becoming so dominant in the ride-sharing industry, or is it, at any time, their employees who are actually just contract, all their drivers are just contractors, right? It should be some employees. They shouldn't, government shouldn't um, impose the burden on, on those kinds of uh, working relationships on, on the company. It would just it would drive costs up. So it's fine. I don't have a problem with them being contracted. It should be government have, has no involvement anyway. They set the terms between employer and employee and call it whatever the heck they want. But because of the nature of that technology and that business of ride sharing apps, they could be the mechanism by which we essentially overnight switch to 
uh, self-driving taxis. And we already have, we covered this a couple weeks ago, self-driving pizza delivery drones. Yeah, on the road, walk on sidewalks, delivering pizza. That is here on the horizon for widespread uh, 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 implementation. All right, now to our, I guess if we have our guests scheduled, let's see, is it now it's on the calendar. And it is for night four. So 10 minutes, we're going to see if we can get through our international headlines here, starting with Pope Francis at NDTV.com. Pope Francis updates canon law to address pedophilia by priests. The purpose of the revision, wrote Pope Francis in introducing the changes, is restoration of justice, the reform of the offender, and the repair of the scandal. Wait. Hmm. Reform of the offender. Now, I, I'm all about justice over punishment. I'm all about restorative justice, community justice, and, and how humanity looks at someone who is overseeing an organization that empowers, hides, and protects some of the world's most offensive criminals, predatory pedophiles. And um, if you're going to say that, yes, uh, we, we're going to reform the offender and repair the scandal. Okay. Restoration of th three things. Restoration of justice. I'm all for it. Reform the offender. I'm all for it. But this is about as low a fucking priority as it gets when it comes to reforming offenders. I mean, we have people in jail for smoking pot. And here's, oh, let's, let's, let's put some correctional efforts to reform pedophile priests. And three, the repair of the scandal. You know what the repair of the scandal is? Fire these motherfuckers off the bat. They are never allowed a church or a child ever again once due process is performed and that is decided unequivocally. That's it. You want to repair the scandal? That's the first step. The second step is for parents who are Catholic to stop trusting the Catholic church with your children. Holy shit. You want to repair the scandal? No, it's going to take more than a papal revision of the canon law to address pedophilia by priests. But uh, you know, nice try. Peretz.com opinion. And this, we're not going to get into the whole opinion. It's a long opinion piece, but it's actually a, a very interesting indicator here. From a Jewish perspective, on Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Bibi, who might be very shortly on his way out. Politics in the Netanyahu era is a dangerous thing, and the PM is the ultimate danger. This opinion from uh, Ode Bisharat. Very, very, very credibly Jewish name. One can say the most dangerous politician in Israeli politics is Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. One could also say that Netanyahu is more dangerous than Donald Trump. At least Trump wasn't stalking congressional Democrats to lure them into his camp. But to agitate, bribe, and rule is the lifeblood of Netanyahu's doctrine. He hasn't merely adopted a policy of divide and conquer, the essence of colonialism, but has upgraded it, including against his own people. He has succeeded in sparking disputes within and breaking down nearly every party institution that stood in his way. He identifies his rival's weak point, applies pressure, and the rest is history. And so much of this is manifest, not just in what is being described here as a brutal kind of Israeli politics, but a brutal imperialism, a, a brutal oppression of the Palestinian people. When you, there, there's no, oh, it's a, it's a conflict between two parties, the, you know, Israel, Palestine. No, it, it's a, a, a criminal and a victim. Israel is the criminal state. Palestinians are the victims in this case. There's, historically, you go, yes, you can say guilt on both sides, where you go back in the conflict, who's, but when it, you look at the totality of it, it is a criminal state with a victim people. Rob B, give the gold back to the owners. Why should the grimy Pope profit even with paper from stolen gold? Indeed, you want to talk about repair the scandal, repair the huge financial scandals behind the accumulation of the Catholic Church as well and the fraud that they have committed to acquire it. So a uh, couple bullet points in the story. Netanyahu fails to secure loyalty in his bloc, but so do his rivals. Israel is heading 
to its most dangerous election ever as Israel electioneers, disillusioned voters could wipe out the Arab parties. So I am hoping that this one editorial, this one opinion piece in Haaretz, mainstream Jewish outlet, Israeli outlet, is indicative of a, a greater shift, not just away from Benjamin Netanyahu, but an actual condemning of his particular brand of political uh, and governmental and militaristic brutality. To China, newatlas.com, China claims new fusion record with its artificial sun nuclear reactor. And I'm thinking, like, I was looking at the story, I'm like, wait, the first image is like an atom in the abstract, like an orange ball of light and series of circles around it. You go, that's, that, that's not what their nuclear reactor looks like. And then, and then I go, okay, oh, well, here's an actual picture. You know, scroll down to that one, Jim. A look inside China's experimental advanced superconducting tokamak, EAST. And the significance of this goal that they're claiming is that they were able to hold plasma at a record 120 million degrees Celsius for 101, yeah, 120 million degrees Celsius <laughs> for 101 seconds. And this is edging closer to the long pursued goal of clean and limitless energy. Uh, the idea behind nuclear fusion, fusion research is to recreate the process that the sun uses to produce monumental amounts of energy where intense heat and pr pressure combine to produce plasma in which atomic nuclei fuse at incredible velocities. I'm like, you just put the effort that you put into this into solar panels. Wouldn't we have accomplished that? Like, The sun is sending us energy. We don't need a little piece of the sun here. We just can absorb, like the point is energy. It's not like we're making bombs or, but who knows, maybe there's some other, you know, possibilities that are, are opened up by having this intense source of energy that, you know, my little amateur brain doesn't know about here with this. Um, but as it describes this picture, I'm looking at this picture. It's like, that doesn't show me a fusion reactor any more than it shows me a set of a Hollywood movie. You know, like, where's the building? Like, and I'm, I'm wondering why this, uh, you know, this article seems skeptical, but I'm kind of joining them in their skepticism too of this whole thing. I'm like, yeah, this China, like this, this, yeah, this thing here that Jim's got on screen right now, this, yeah, this could be China's government has staged more involved fake outs than this. We'll see. Also from China, AP, China reports human cases, cases case, excuse me, China reports human case of H10N3 bird flu, a possible first. And so to scare people, what do they have? A, a table in China full of dead chickens. A man in eastern China is contracted what might be the world's first human case of H10N3 strain or bird flu, but the risk of large scale spread is low, the government said Tuesday. Wait, wait, which government? The Chinese government that said they had nothing to do with this, that it was America's fault for sending the virus to China, or the American government that said um, two weeks to flatten the curve? Which which one of these governments are we supposed to trust? The 41-year-old, but again, they want you to be confused. They want you to not know who to trust and go, well, let's trust the least bad option, <clears throat> which is still a really shitty option. The 41-year-old man in Jiangsu province, northwest of Shanghai, was hospitalized April 28th and is in stable condition, the National Health Commission said on its website. So, yeah, H10N3 might be uh, coming back to relevance. And with that, let's go to our guest, ladies and gentlemen, Ashley Short. Excuse me. <clears throat> it's been a tough day. It's been dry. Let's, let's do this right. As long as we're putting this off, we'll do it right. Ladies and gentlemen. Ashley Shade joins us today to mark the first day of the government official LGBTQ plus Pride Month. And Ashley Shade is the chair of Outright Libertarian, sorry, the Outright Libertarian's chair candidate. Um, hold on, what is for Adams Council? We'll be speaking tonight on being appointed to the council because of a vacancy. That was what is. 
what is this on being asked to what is this on the calendar um ashley shade has been a gsm activist since 2017 when she decided to run for city council in her home city of north adams massachusetts she joined the libertarian party in june 2018 and has become one of the most active and outspoken leaders for liberty and the gsm community ashley i got to see at uh some conventions recently she's been an incredible activist always a great person to have around Ashley, I very, I deeply apologize for the clumsiness of this interview coming together. I would be happy to have you on again when you're feeling better, when we are better organized. But since we've got you here, at least by voice today, uh, the platform is yours. Is there anything you want to share, promote with your libertarian activism or to mark uh, the first day of Pride Month? Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Adam. And uh, if I were feeling better, I'd love to come back on again later on when I am feeling better and, and do a full show with you. Um, but today is the first day of Pride Month. And I do want to say, I do want to remind everybody that 50 years ago, this is the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots. I want to remind everybody that Pride started off as a riot. <laughs> as a fight against government tyranny and oppression of the LGBTQ people for just being themselves and existing in public. And so remember that. Remember that pride was a riot. Remember that pride has always been a fight against police, against brutality, against government and oppression. And that 50 years ago also... We had the founding of the Libertarian Party. Mm -hmm. And 50 years ago when the Libertarian Party was founded, one of our founding principles was that of equality, that of supporting gay marriage, that of ending the sodomy laws, that of ending government interfering in your lives and interfering in your personal relationships. Yes, so, we, have, we have from the beginning been the party of uh solving the old party's hypocrisy on this issue and all these related issues i will i would i would want to ask you ashley about this you know when it started as a riot it sadly declined into a parade despite all the material progress right i'd rather have a riot than a parade to make some real change happen well, but uh it took some time to get there. Uh, there was the original Stonewall riot, you know, the Stonewall riots. And then, you know, there was kind of this small little celebration of, hey, this happened a year ago. But the parades and the celebrations didn't really start and pick up until the 90s publicly. In many places around the country, everybody was still, you know, in the closet. Everybody was still pushed underground. Everybody was still, you know, let them let them not be seen. And we don't want to hear from them either. Um, you know, our community was ignored. And now we're in a position here, you know, 50 years later in the year 20, you know, in this new decade, the 2020s, where we not only have the ability to be seen and heard, as all human beings deserve to be seen and heard, but we have a unique ability to become our own representation. And representation of different views and different people and different ideals is so important because we don't live long enough to experience all the things ourselves. We need to count on the experiences of other human beings and those unique experiences belong at the table. And so I'm in a unique position where I'm running for city council here in North Adams. And I have two very unique positions. One is a member of the GSM community, Gender and Sexual Minorities, which is the acronym we like to use it outright for LGBTQ. Um, it's a little more inclusive and it doesn't have all the, yes. the letters. Um, so it's just easier to say. Uh, but we, we like, you know, I have a, a unique ability not only to represent the GSM community, but also represent the Libertarian Party and Libertarian ideals in my community. And to be able to present liberty minded solutions, solutions that don't require more government, solutions that can help loosen and remove restrictions on the liberties on our personal liberties in our life and really 
make a difference to marginalized communities who traditionally have been most oppressed and affected by the tyranny of government? Well, Ashley, what, what I wanted to get at, at that with that or get at with that question was that it's it's probably a good thing that riots aren't necessary any longer to make political change happen. Yeah. Running for office, peaceful interventions, uh, just talking to people, changing hearts and minds as you have <laughs> been, obviously is a lot better than a riot when that's not necessary. But there's an old political saying, if you see a riot, jump out in front of it and call it a parade. Can you speak to how the old parties perhaps have co-opted this uh, you know, original intent with the Stonewall riots and the cause uh, of equality to serve uh, their, their corporatist uh, fiat currency bank supporting political partisan agendas and, and, and why uh, the Libertarian Party is, is so important as a venue for GSM advocacy in light of that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, here's the thing when it comes to riots, sometimes they're necessary. And we found that out last year. Riots are still happening. We're, we're not done with the riots because eventually we, we reach our breaking point and, and enough people are killed and enough people are harmed that we say, no, enough is enough. We're fighting back now. However, we can reach more people and make change in a more peaceful way through compassion, education, and love, which is the message that I talk about, which is how I conduct myself and how I use liberty to help free people and give them better opportunities. When it comes to pride, what it's become as this corporate game of, hey, we see you and we're going to pretend to care about you. But it's pretend the same kind of support the Democrats have pretended to give our community for decades. I do want to remind everybody that despite having the House, the Senate, and the presidency, gay marriage was not legalized by the Democrats. It was legalized by the Supreme Court. The Democrats, who say they are champions of gay rights, refused to even take up the measure. And now, a decade later, Joe Biden, who a decade before said he was not in favor of gay marriage, wants to parade around like he's a champion. And his vice president, Kamala Harris, wants to parade around like she's a champion for LGBTQ rights while she was imprisoning LGBTQ sex workers and denying trans people health care in prison. Mm -hmm. So... For people that really are trying to say, we support the community, there's always a but. And that <laughs> but is, we now have evolved and changed, but only because the poll numbers say we can't win unless we do. And that's the real secret behind the Democratic Party. Yep. They change their views, but only when the polls tell them to. Oh, yes. They don't actually care about our community. And this was pointed out a few weeks ago in Texas by a, a man from the Texas legislature from Houston who ha who's a Democrat. And he had a bill voted down by his colleagues. So as an act of revenge, he reintroduced anti-transgender legislation that the Democrats had already defeated because they beat it, they wouldn't support his own bill. So it just goes to show that the Democrats are really just trying to play games with our lives and our livelihood. Whereas libertarians, we believe the government shouldn't be involved in your life and your personal decisions. We believe that you at birth have the right to live your life how you choose, love whom you choose to love, so long as you're not hurting anybody else. And that's the big thing. What you do as a consenting adult is your business and nobody else's. And Absolutely. the government has no place in interfering in that in your life. You, know, you remind me of the definition of a libertarian as someone who doesn't follow the statement, I believe in freedom with the word but. And it's like, that's what you hear from 
the Democrats, uh, you know, we believe in freedom and rights for this community, but we put our ideology first, which means we put our service of our corporate sponsors first. And for the Republicans, maybe on that issue, it's it's a little less pandering. Uh, the, the base of the GOP is either neutral pro oh, or anti, but the party has, has monopolized and monetized for themselves somehow and, and politicized being you know, anti anything not cisgender as, excuse me, as that part of that cultural conservatism. Ashley, I want to share a comment from Elizabeth Coquillard, who is, uh, according to her Facebook profile frame, one of your supporters. I love Ashley's campaign message of compassion, education, love. I think the LP has been sorely missing. You can't change the comment while I'm reading it. Who did that? How many, how many people do we have backstage right now? I was reading that comment and someone changed it halfway through. Can we get that comment back? There we go. I think the LP has been sorely missing this approach to reaching people where they're at. We need more Ashley's in the movement. Ashley, uh, your thoughts on, on what makes your campaign message of compassion, education, love unique uh, wh and, and what people uh, you know can do to support you aside from anybody in the country being able to donate and do online stuff uh, for people in, in North Adams, Massachusetts area. Um, your thoughts? Yeah, so my, my message is unique because we don't hear about love and politics anymore. Or we, it, it's, it's, a, it's a different message. People don't talk about love. They talk about hate. They talk about how anybody who thinks differently than you is the enemy and you have to swear to hate them. And if you don't hate them, then you're not doing enough to protect yourself. Everybody's out to kill you who thinks differently than you do. And that's why the message of compassion, education, and love is so important. We have to take the time to be compassionate, to listen to constituents, to listen to voters, to listen to people and hear where they're at. We need to hear them first, because by listening to them and, and finding out what their problems are and actually hearing their problems, we show them that we actually care. And then we use education. Hi, I, I get it. I know you're having these issues, and a lot of them are caused by government. So here's a liberty-minded solution that can help, one that doesn't need more government. We have homeless issues. Okay, let's work together as a community to feed the homeless. Let's get rid of restrictive laws that don't allow citizens to feed homeless in many communities. Let's get rid of the red tape and the bureaucracy. And let's together as a community solve problems and help each other. One thing that we've learned from COVID is that humans are not meant to be isolated. We need each other whether we like it or not. We need each other. And so I want to live in a world where rather than fighting each other and causing each other harm and trying to prevent other people from succeeding, we are living in a world where we're all working together to succeed. We're uplifting each other. We're pushing each other to do better. And we're putting our efforts into helping those who most need it. And that kind of a world and that kind of society and that kind of community can throw and thrive and can grow and thrive together. And that's really what compassion, education, and love is all about. It's about loving the community, it's about loving the people here. And it's about coming together to have these conversations, even when we don't agree, to find solutions and still take care of people, still take care of the problems that we face as a community by working together and giving everybody a seat at the table and making sure that we hear all the voices, even the most absurd ones, because everybody has the right and, and the ability to contribute and should be able to if they feel that they can. Now, not every idea is gonna work, but it's important that everybody have a voice at the table. And that's what I'm doing. I'm running for office to be a voice at the table for, for the GSM community, for the trans community. And I have a unique opportunity. My election is in November on November 2nd. However, there is currently a vacancy on the city council here in North Adams. And tonight, the city council 
the eight members who are currently still serving are going to be selecting a replacement for the ninth seat, the vacant seat. And I am one of two people who submitted a letter of interest in filling wow. up. So this evening, there is an opportunity on the first day of Pride for my community to say, we would like to see LGBTQ representation from a qualified candidate. And that's the most important part. Yes, it's about representing. Yes, it's about diversity. But I am a qualified person to serve. I've served in my community. I've been on boards. I'm on the Human Services Commission in the city. I'm on another working group that was put together by the city council. I've served the community and served the city. And so I'm a qualified candidate who they have the opportunity to choose to come in and fill out the remainder of this term on the city council. And that's something that I'm looking forward to uh, this evening. So that there's an opportunity for this in my community. It doesn't happen very often. You know, this is this is a really unique moment. But tonight, my community, my city council has a chance to either uphold the status quo or go with somebody different who has different that's, ideas. That's awesome. This is a very exciting opportunity. I would encourage more libertarians to look for this. And again, Ashley, apologize for the awkwardness of bringing this together the last minute today. I hope we can get you on in the next week or two to tell us this story properly, do a full 30-minute interview. I'm a fan. I'm a supporter. And I, and I think this is a great example of libertarian and GSM activism. So thank you for everything you're doing right now. Yeah, thank you so much. And if anybody wants to check things out and learn more about what we're doing, learn more about the campaign, ashleyshade.com is the website. You can find all of our social media links on there, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, A Shade for Office is the handle, but all the links are on our website. If you have the ability to send over a donation, please send over a donation. Um, we've done very great in that regard, but you know, this is going to be a tricky election and we can always use more support. So please check out the website. Please sign up if you're looking to volunteer. We'd be happy to have new volunteers. Send your donations, whatever you can do to help get the word out there. Like, share, and comment on the social media. Push that up through the algorithms so people see that we are out here fighting for the city of North Adams and my community. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ashley. Thank All you. right, let's get... Let's get to Ed Vallejo quick. We just got a few minutes here. Do we have a new leader in our comment contest? We're going with that last entry. Short on time. Top three are already in the club. I'm <laughs> hitting the ground running. I'm out of here. Good day and happy Memorial Day, fellow veteran. All right. Thank you, Mr. Ed. Boom. Let's go to Jim. Let's go for Good the show notes. notes. T.me forward slash Anniversary Man is the public Telegram channel. You can join us at Patreon forward slash Adamverse Demand to support us monthly and get bonuses like 15% off and free shipping on all our stuff. Cigarfederation.com. That website comes with the promo code Adam10 so you can get 10% off your entire order. Instagram's tag is at the Garden of Freedom to check out everything going on up there in Gardenia. The Crypto Six is an awesome website. Check it out and do your research. And GoGreenEnergyOnline.com is the best do it yourself research website for off, off grid homesteaders doing it themselves. So, welcome to GoodNewsNetwork.org. Good news in history for June first. It was uh, we got some birthdays, different 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 levels of what I would include in good news in history. Happy eighty uh, fourth birthday to actor and narrator. If you didn't know him as such, if I said actor and narrator, do you know who I'm talking about? Who is the most famous actor and narrator in the world? There is one and only right. Morgan Freeman. Ah. Oh. Uh, it was also on this day in 1831, James Clark Ross discovered the magnetic North Pole. Uh, Andy Griffin was born on this day in 1926. More importantly, it was on this day in 1926 that Norma Jean Mortensen was born in Los Angeles before she became known as Marilyn Monroe. Norma Jean. And on this day in 1974, the Heimlich Maneuver. For Rescuing Choking Victims was published in the Journal of Emergency Medicine on this day in 1980. And this, this is not, 
is this good news or bad news? Because CNN wasn't always bad news. No. But it was on this day in 1980 that CNN began broadcasting, and for the first time, Americans could watch news updates 24 hours a day. And 31 years ago today, U.S. President D uh, George H.W., joined the leader of the Soviet Union, Gorbachev, to sign a pact to end chemical weapons production and destroy their nation's stockpiles. But if that wasn't good enough news for you, it was on this day in 1967, the Beatles released Sgt. Pepper's Open Arts Cup book club. Band with that, peace and love, y'all. Choose happiness and be excellent to each other.